thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you to the Ad Club for having me here today. And thank you for all of you to come out on this really cold morning to hear about our story about becoming Santander here in the US. I hope I meet your expectations by the end of the day. But it's an incredible two-year journey. I think half of this group are the team of people that participated. So this is our story, not really my story. And hopefully, they can share in what we're going to talk about today. So I thought I would begin with taking us back a little bit, because I'm not sure how many of you know about Santander, know about Sovereign Bank, but a little bit of history that actually the, the bank was bought by Santander back in 2009. If you remember, 2009 wasn't a particularly good time in our market, and it wasn't a particularly good time for the banking industry. And Santander came in and bought Sovereign, which was a bit of a struggling bank, I would say, at that point in time. And uh, it was an $80 billion bank. We had about um, 722 branches. We were very focused in the mid-Atlantic and northeast region. And this was really Santander's first entree into the US market from a retail and commercial perspective. This was their first purchase of a bank in the US. We did have some other assets um, that we had purchased prior to this. Um, an incredible global organization is all I can really say to sum it up. You know, I, I've been with the bank a little over three years. And when you, you are thinking of joining an organization, you always do your due diligence. You try and find out about who you're joining and what they're all about. And I don't think I could have ever anticipated the breadth and depth of this company, the international expanse that they have, just the expertise of these people. And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor. Um, Barbara Ali and I always joke about once you go to Santander in Madrid, you have the Santander touch, and you are never the same again. And it is truly. Um, it's truly right. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this video. It's something that we shared with our team members as part of the rebrand. So it also creates some messages, includes some messages from other team members around the world welcoming, welcoming us into the Scent and their family. But it will give you a flavor as to who we are. So let's take a quick. Founded in Spain in 1857, Santander is now an international bank with 187,000 team members, over 14,000 branches, and 3.3 million shareholders. Santander is the number one banking brand in the world. It ranks among the world's financial leaders with a larger network and more branches than any other international bank. Our name stands for strength, leadership, and achievement to 102 million customers all over the world. Since 2007, Santander has undergone a process of unifying all of our brands. The same transformation that you're experiencing today. In country after country, from Brazil to Mexico to the UK, we've been able to succeed, to empower our customers, and to grow. Geographic diversification is key to our vision and remarkable growth. Nós não apenas trocamos a marca, nós unimos o que havia de melhor entre dois grandes bancos, Real e Santander. We joined Santander in 2011, and ever since we've become a top three bank in Poland. We are excited about becoming Santander soon and sharing the values of the brand across the country. Customers, um, you know, trust the brand. There's a lot of positive and benefits that come being part of a global bank like Santander. Somos un equipo muy cohesionado que trabaja duro para que la, para que Santander brille y se vuelva referencia como la banca moderna, eficiente, sana y responsable que nuestros clientes y la sociedad mexicana necesita. Our determination to succeed goes hand in hand with the commitment to our communities and higher education. Our global Santander Universities program connects us with more than 1,000 universities in 20 countries. Santander commitment with higher education, it's something unique. Uh, it makes Santander different for the rest of the banks in the world. Our brand is new to the United States, and we're here to offer our customers an experience that aligns with their ideas. And we use all our strength, all our innovation capacity, all our leadership to position Santander as the bank that empowers you to achieve your goals. Wherever we are, we help our customers make progress every day, whether they are retail customers, small business clients, or the corporations who turn to us as a trusted partner. I want to start by saying thank you for the great job you have done. Now, as we head into a turning point for our bank in the US, 
please always keep in mind these three very simple but fundamental ideas. First, customer focus. Everything we do must have just one purpose, to offer our customers great service. This means our banking service must be simple, transparent, trustworthy, and help our customers achieve their goals. Second, you are part of one of the most solid, efficient, and profitable banks in the world, with one of the most valuable brands. The rebranding you are undertaking reflects our absolute confidence about our ability to grow in the US. And finally, teamwork. We can only accomplish our goals if we work together as one team. We wish you the best of luck. Mucha suerte. Bienvenido. Congratulations. Bienvenidos. We wish you all the best with the new brand. Mucho éxito. Gratuluyeme. Bienvenidos. Mucho éxito en esta nueva etapa. Welcome to Santander. We have a great challenge ahead, but one we can achieve. You are part of Santander, a dynamic group with a successful business model and a strong commitment to our customers, shareholders, and communities. Let's do it together. This is your moment. I am sure that you will exceed your goals and that very soon your contribution to the group results will be very significant. I look forward to seeing you soon at our branches with Banco Santander Red Flame. So, an incredible, an incredible global organization. Ten core markets. We are number one, number two market share in almost every market that we are around the world. And the next stop for us was here in the U.S. It was always our chairman's ambition, Chairman Botin, to come into the U.S. market and to grow and to be strong. And so here we are, ready to take on the challenge. So, our challenge and our opportunity was how do you take the number one retail financial brand in the world and bring it into the U.S. market where you have zero brand awareness and you're up against some real significant competitors, some really great banks are in our, in our, in our industry. So this was our challenge and our opportunity. So first things first, I think there's a lot of definitions about rebranding and I thought I'd take us back a little bit because our rebranding really started for us back in 2009 when the bank was purchased. We made a conscious decision at that point in time that we were not going to rebrand to Santander. There was a lot of discussions back then. Should we change our name immediately? Should we change our signs? And we felt really strongly that we wanted to be able to offer a different experience to our customers when we entered into the market. So way back when in 2009, our starting point was about financial security and stability for our customers. A lot of time was spent by the executive team back then to really strengthen our balance sheet, return us to profitability, really increase our capital, and we did so. In a really remarkable point in time, I can't take any credit for this, even though I am a CPA, we went from being incredibly unprofitable to very profitable and continuing profits throughout those years. These are all, pub all public information. What this showed was we wanted to turn to profitability, we wanted to be a strong, stable bank. That was the first part of our pillars to be able to move forward. The second really important piece for us was about technology. I guess anybody in this room who's been in technology know it's always complex and always takes longer than you anticipate. So from our perspective, we also wanted to make sure our technology platform, which is really the foundation of a bank, was strong, stable, and would enable us to grow. For those of you who know Sovereign Bank, Sovereign itself was an amalgamation of many little banks all over the different parts of our footprint. And all of them had different systems, and none of them talked to each other. If you open a bank account in Boston and went into New York, the bank didn't know you. It was not a unified, integrated bank. So we needed to fix this. In every country that we operate, we integrate with what we call our core IT platform, Partnon. This was a multi-year complex project that ended in 2012. Really remarkably, really great transition. We moved all of our customers onto the new platform. So we were ready to go. Strong, stable, viable bank, growing, becoming profitable, and a really strong foundation technology-wise to grow. A lot of other things happened behind the scenes with going from a thrift to a national charter, changing our products and services, but really being ready and feeling confident that we could then enter the market. So our next step was a date. And this may sound really funny, but the date moved a lot, and we actually really had to pin down our CEO. We said, we got to pick a date. Remember? If we don't pick a date, we're never really going to do this. So there was a lot of debate around what was the right date, and October 17th get, got picked. You can ask me later why we picked that date. It's kind of a funny story. But October 17th was the date that we picked. 226 days until we were going to rebrand the bank. 
And I show you this funny little kiosk because it became like my arch, this became like my nemesis. We decided it was going to be a good idea to kick off the rebranding with a ceremony for all of our team members so they could feel very engaged in the process. So we built these countdown clocks, these kiosks, and we put them in our, in our headquarters in Boston. We also had one in New York. But I can tell you, every day that I walked in, I saw the clock ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking. And it got to be 30 days and 10 days and 5 days. I wanted to start throwing tomatoes. It was not fun. But the clock is there today, and it doesn't have a countdown clock. So it was, our, it was our beginning. It was our way to engage our team members, to make them part of the process. I often get asked, did you have to sell your team members on this? We did not have to sell our team members on this. They wanted to become Santander. They wanted to become Santander back in 2009. So setting a date and making it real and making a ceremony was an important part of our process of transformation. So let's talk a little bit about building of the brand and the rebrand itself, because many of you in this room may have been part of rebrands. I've been part of rebrands in prior companies, and I can tell you it was not like the rebrand here at Santander. To us, it wasn't just about a sign change, a logo, a new name. We had, we had our dual identity for many years. It was much more than that. It really was about introducing a new bank into the market with, obviously, a new identity. So I wanted to just give you a flavor about what happened behind the scenes. And this won't give you the full magnitude, but hopefully it'll give you some perspective that there were hundreds of people working on this project. There were 10 different work streams. Marketing was only one of them. Marketing did lead the entire bank-wide project, but there was only one work stream that dealt with marketing. We also ambitiously took on a lot of other initiatives in that 226 days so that when we launched to the market, it really would be a different experience for our customers. So we decided to tackle the project of building an entire new website within those 22, 226 days. A whole new platform, a whole new vendor, a whole new experience, new navigation, rewrite every single thing. Those of you who've been part of websites know that alone can be a whole year project onto itself. We wanted to do that in the 226 days. Every one of our branches was touched. 722 branches were changed. Every sign was changed. Every branch was refurbished. A minimum level of renovation in every single branch was a complete transformation of our retail network and the biggest part of our investment. ATMs, we had very outdated ATMs. and We felt we needed to start moving and evolving, obviously, towards a more cutting edge and efficient ATM methodology. So we started rolling out new ATM capabilities before and during the rebrand, and we continue to do so even this day. Social media. We had no presence on social media. We had a lot of debates about social media, but we really decided that we needed to have a presence on social media before we launched. We wanted to be transparent. We wanted to be able to have our customers talk to us. So we launched Facebook, Twitter, and shortly thereafter, YouTube, again, on October 17th. Everything was converging on this day. Team member preparedness. I'll talk a lot about this. I can't overemphasize this, that we focused a lot on our team members. To us, it was an inside-out approach. We really felt like we needed to have our team members on board, understanding what was happening with the company, where were we going, what was the brand about, how did they fit, and how could they feel part of this entire process. Communications, 90 days before we talked to all of our customers. This was really important to us before the actual launch day. We wanted to ensure, we wanted to retain every single customer. We wanted to make sure that they knew what was happening and they had no questions. So 90 days before, we sent out communications to every customer, a note from our CEO, emails to those that we had email addresses, a separate page on our website with facts and figures and videos talking about the company. We had a separate email address where people could ask us questions and we would respond within 24 hours. We had FAQs. We had training for our call centers, for our branches. We spent a lot of time on our customers. And you know what's really nice is I've run across customers along the way in other places I've spoken, and they've come up to me and said, you know what, thank you so much for all those communications you sent out. We really felt like we understood what was going on. And for them, there really wasn't going to be a big change. There was no new credit cards or, or ATM cards or new, you know, new statements. It really was a smooth transition, and we really wanted to make sure that that went through well. Externally, we spent a lot of time before October 17th talking to the press. We had not talked to the press a lot in the past, and we felt it was really important that we got out in front of the 17th so they could ask us whatever they wanted to know about the company. Any questions, anything that was on their mind, that they understood our vision and where we were going. We spent a lot of time with our internal team members and spokespeople making sure that they were well prepared. We spent a lot of time across our entire region building those relationships so we were ready to go. 
And then finally, we took on a very ambitious project to launch a new cutting edge product in the industry, again, aligning with the rebrand, and that's the extra 20 checking account that maybe some of you know, and I'll talk a little bit about again. So this was a multi-phased, multi-working group, huge governance around this, run by the CEO and myself and a management team that we would meet every month, then every two weeks, then every week, then every day, leading up to, the, to October 17th. These are just some fun figures, some fun facts. I'm not even nearly enough. I love the one about we, we did 32,000 gallons of red paint. You know we love our red. We had 1 million square feet of new carpeting. A lot of things went on behind the scenes. So let me, um, let me switch gears a little bit and, and, and talk about our approach and dive a little bit down more into the marketing, marketing side. So you heard our global CEO, Javier Marine, talk about that from a, from a company's perspective, from a values perspective, the most important thing to us is our customer. It is really what drives us. It is what we think about and, and talk an awful lot about as a global organization. But everybody says that. Everybody, if you're not customer centric, you might as well not really be in this business, right? So everybody says that they're customer centric, but it was really important to us that we could demonstrate it. We, this was not about an advertising campaign. This was really about being relevant in the US market, really understanding the consumer and understanding what was important to them so that when we did introduce our brand, that it would mean something to them, that they would know what we stood for, and that we could demonstrate that we knew it was important to them. So very early on, we made a decision that we were going to do something a little bit different. So a couple things. The first thing we did is we aligned with Communa Space, my friends right here in the front row, with Diane Heston and Jim and Emily and the partners at Communa Space. I will say this is one of the things that I'm, I'm very, very proud about because we wanted a year in advance of the rebrand we set up a community with Communa Space. And if you don't know about them, you should go find out about them. We set up a community with 200 customers, 200 prospects, sorry, 300 customers, 300 prospects, and 300 team members. So we have almost a thousand person community. This is not a focus group. This is not a research, research engine. This is really a platform that allows these individuals to be part of helping us build and shape our company. It was the best thing that we did. A year in advance, we asked them questions about their current banking relationships, how they feel about money, what's on their minds, what's important to them. We were in this community every single day. It was an ongoing process. Every new product that we launched, we put into this community and asked them questions about it. Everything that we did with advertising, we put into this community. I think we put everything into this community. Every time we have a question, we call up Community Space and say, we want to go in, we want to test this. We want to know what the consumer thinks, not just what we think, what's important to them. And it absolutely shaped how we move forward with building of our brand. We also spent an awful lot of time with Arnold, who is our, our core agency and who really helped us also look underneath all of this quantitatively and qualitatively. One of the other things that I'm really proud about that we did with Arnold was our team member research. We spent a lot of time, once we built our brand and our positioning, finding out what our team members felt about it. Could they actually deliver on what we were about to say into the market? So we went through an exercise of picking team members from across our bank, all different levels, all different types of roles, and went out and asked them some really tough questions about the bank, how they felt about the bank, how they felt about a bank for your ideas, how they felt about our proposition of listening and simplifying and enabling and could they really deliver on it? And I'll tell you, it was a pretty big report. There were some really good things in that report, and there were some things that weren't so good in that report. And I give our CEO a lot of credit, because we instantly put task force and people around those areas that were going to be problems to us delivering on this promise. We still have that today, but it became a part of who we were back then, a year in advance of even launching this brand. We wanted to know as much as we could about our team members and our consumers. We talked to over 1,200 stakeholders during this period of time. So insight research was an important part of who we were. Let me share a little bit of some of the insights. Those of you in the banking industry, none of this will be very surprising to you, but it was important to us. Again, we're bringing a, a bank into the US. We're bringing a new bank into the US. So this is what we were up against from a category um, specific nature. We knew the banking is at the lowest level of trust. We all know that in the banking industry, that consumers still have a lot of apprehension with banking. We also know that there is a lot of competition. There's over 7,500 7, banks across the US. I know that number fluctuates, but it's about 7,500. And here, there's more banks per capita in our footprint than anywhere else in the world. So anywhere else in the US. So we were up against a lot of competition, yet 
our consumers say there's no differentiation between these banks. They all appear to be the same from our perspective. There was a survey done that said 65% of those consumers said, we know there's a lot of different banks, but we really don't see a lot of differentiation. And because of that, we're not really willing to switch, which is why there's a really low rate of switching. And you all know the numbers if you're in banking. It fluctuates between 5.9 and 11% on any given day. It's not a lot of people who are moving back and forth between banks because they don't really think it's worth it. They don't really see a big difference. We then went in and tested with their consumers what were they thinking in our communities, what were they thinking about their existing banking relationships. And again, similar themes came up. They talked about that they thought that all banks were the same. What was interesting is the people in this community, most of them weren't happy with their banking relationships. Almost all of them said, you know, I'm not really particularly happy with the bank that I'm working with. I work with multiple banks, but because I don't really see a difference, it's not really worth it to me to move my money. They're in a state of inertia, really. They're just sort of, they're just where they are because they don't see a difference. They think that banks talk an awful lot about themselves, their products, their services, their capabilities. We're global, we're strong, we have this many customers. They haven't really demonstrated, they don't feel that they've de we've demonstrated that we know them, that we're listening to them, and that we're building relationships with them. They know that we all have the same issues from a banking perspective. On one side, our margins are being squeezed. On the other side, the regulators are on us. And they feel that they're the ones in the middle that are taking the impact of all of these changes. They're the ones with the fees and everything else that's around it that they're being impacted by this. They think the banks set all the rules. One person in our community said, the house always wins. Interesting. They think that we make things confusing. Lots of jargon. We've heard this before. Lots of jargon. Lots of products. Just a little bit of nuances between the products. It's not simple. It's not easy to do business with us. And finally, we asked them about themselves, about money and finances and how they felt about it. And really, across the board, I can say that most people feel that they're, they're not comfortable with money in general. It doesn't matter how much money they had or what income level or what education level. In general, people just feel uncomfortable with money and finances and what to do with it. And they're overwhelmed. They don't really know what to do. They see a lot of different options. They're really not sure what the right next step is. And because they don't really feel like a bank is listening to them and getting to know them, they're really not doing very much. Or they have a lot of little relationships, money dabbling in a lot of different places, but no one really helping them make progress. And they want to make progress. This came out in the research pretty loud and clear that despite all of this, they're looking for a partner. I can remember a gentleman in the community, which I, I can't forget this quote, I always talk about it, who said, I'm 40 years old, but the money in my bank account looks like I'm 20 years old. I mean, it's extremely telling. So this might not be that revolutionary to you, but what it came back is a lot about back to basics, really from a banking perspective. That what they said when you look at all of this is that they want a partner, an ally, someone who works with them, someone that gets to know them, a little bit of a deeper relationship, understands how they want to interact with the bank, understand what's important to them, their ideas, their dreams, their goals, and works with them to help them seize the opportunity and move forward and make progress. So I thought I would show you a little bit, a little excerpt from the community. Um, these are people's home, homemade videos, so don't judge us on our video quality here, OK? But this is really from the community. We wanted to give you a flavor of what it's really like. And you can, we'll go from there. For the past year, we've been listening to over 1,000 people. Let's hear what they have to say. It feels good to know that, that the bank listens, that management, people in uh, positions of leadership there, that uh, they don't just march in a direction and, and see if people follow. This community has brought together um, a diverse group of people to be able to share their ideas. Having the ability to communicate my thoughts and ideas on what I'd like to see in a financial institution has been wonderful. I feel like my ideas, my feedback is truly warranted, not just warranted because maybe like the top head honchos are looking for statistics. I feel like I'm almost um, in the board meeting with you guys, you know, making the decisions, like we're part of a team. I don't know that I've ever had the experience before of impacting um, a, comp a large company and how they uh, shape their 
uh, product and their marketing. I actually talked to my husband about switching even more of our stuff over because I said I, I feel like this bank is on the cutting edge. I feel like they're not stuck in old-fashioned um, rules, regulations. Um, I feel like they're, they're forging new territory. And to be honest, I would absolutely love to be a part of that. So the, the community, I think everyone has their own perspectives of who is in this community. It's people that don't have jobs and they're just sitting around and want to go on and talk to us, right? It really isn't. I mean, I, we know who some of these people are behind the scenes. You have in there a med student. You have in there a professor. You have in there, like, educated people, the people that are our consumers, the people that we want to work with us. There is nothing more powerful than listening to what they have to say and how they feel about banking and their money and, and what keeps them up at night. I can say really early on, what really struck me the most and really sold me on doing this was the prospect community. Because these were people that couldn't even pronounce sovereign. It was really funny early on. They couldn't even, they didn't even know who sovereign was and they live in this area. It tells you a lot about our brand, our old brand. So these people didn't know us, weren't really interested in switching. And what started to happen as we were leaning in and getting to know them and asking them questions, they started leaning in more to us. They started saying to us, you know, this is interesting. This bank is really different. I never really thought about you before. I really am going to start thinking about you. We do really want to check you out once you, you rebrand and become Centendaire. And you heard the woman talk about it. it. It's real. The more you ask, the more you listen, you get to know, and you're truly interested. Not just think you're interested, but you really are interested and take that and use it as input. It makes a difference. So all of this insight, all of this input were instrumental in really about a bag for your ideas. This is our global claim. And I will say, this global claim came through in the middle of our process. And I give Arnold an awful lot of credit, because we were building our, you know, our claim here for the US market. And this came globally. And of course, we're part of a global organization. We're not going to go off and build our own identity in the US market. But we did need to know what was important in the US market. And that was a, a general understand from a global perspective that Santander Bank for Your Ideas is who we are, but each market is going to be a little bit different. So all the insights and all the research and all the conversations were really going to help inform us as to how do we bring this to life relevant, in a relevant way here in the US market. Really early on, we worried about would this work? What would consumers think about this? And we put it in the community. And what people came back and said is, you know, we really like this. We do think there's a place for a bank that they really can help us take these ideas and turn them into a reality. So we knew we were onto something strong. So a bank for your ideas is pretty simple. We are a bank. We are here for our customers. We're here with products and services and resources and support. In the middle of it is them. It's all about them. It's all about listening to us. It's all about building relationships. And that can be listening and relationships one-on-one. -on -one. That can be through technology. It can be the way they want it to be. But it's about them and knowing them. And at the end of the day, it's about their ideas, their hopes, their dreams, their goals, and how we can be a partner and an ally to work with them to make them a realization. So an example, a visual example. Because this came out in the community. We all have ideas. You know, Think about when you woke up this morning, all the different things you thought about. Many of us have them, right? When we're walking to work or in the car or on the subway. Maybe, you, maybe it's about your child and education. Maybe it's about buying a new home. Maybe it's about a small business that you want to start. There's a lot of ideas, but often these ideas sort of go off. They become ideas, and they never become realized. We see a role for ourselves as a partner with our customers to help them take those ideas and turn them into a reality and be able to make progress and move forward. So let me talk a little bit about how we brought all this to life. So we did, so we did our homework. We spent a lot of time with consumers. We did a lot of research and insight. We felt, we felt confident about the brand, the positioning. But how are we going to bring this to life? And so we first started internally. I talked about this before. It was incredibly important to us that our team members and key stakeholders were on board with us. So early on, we made a decision. Well, I shouldn't say early on. Later on, we decided two weeks, two weeks before we were going to launch, that was really important that we get out in front of all of our team members and talk about the bank and the strategy and where we were going and how they were going to be part of it. So we held five town hall meetings across our entire footprint we have 9,000 team members. We reached about 5,000 team members. Our CEO and our entire executive team went across to all of these meetings. And we had face-to-face, 1,000-person -face, town hall events. They walked into a room that looked like this. And they walked out of a room with all of the brand, all of the messaging, all of the advertising, everything, what they were going to experience two weeks later in the marketplace. We also did a lot of events in New York City the day before 
the launch to engage customers and VIPs. And so I thought we'd show you a little video as to what some of that looked like. Thank you for joining us today for a special event on the eve of our rebrand to Santander here in the United States. I'm Kathy Klingler, Chief Marketing Officer of Santander in the U.S. Santander Universities and our commitment to higher education with over 1,074 educational institutions around the world is part of our DNA as a company. To the sound of the radio. To the sound of the beat. To the sound of the radio. Yeah, to the sound of the beat. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And you know what? I think it was the turning point with our team members. I really do. We spent a lot of time that whole year talking to them, but not until we really did the town hall meetings and brought them all together, and they could see the energy, and they could see the vision of where we went, did they really buy in and really move forward with us in a different way. I really, truly believe that. So now we were ready. We are ready to go. We were a day away from um, our launch. This was, though all those things, most of those things were happening on October 16th, the day before the event. So our launch was across our entire footprint. We did an official launch in New York City in Herald Square with our chairman, Amelia Botin, where we unveiled our first US branch, our first US Santander branch. But simultaneously, we also did unveilings in Boston, Philadelphia, Rhode Island, Reading, Pennsylvania, and we had events in every one of our corporate headquarters. These were events that were held with our team members, with customers, with the community. It was important to them that we painted the town red in every one of our markets and that everybody was involved in this day. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about what that looked like um, on that day. It's formerly known as Sovereign Bank. They changed your name to Santander. Today is a day for Santander employees. The time is now for us. It's a great feeling. Santander is here and it's here to stay. Sweet old luscious life. Celebrate your dreams when you are away. Doesn't it day so? It's been a long time coming. For the last four years, we have worked very hard to get to the point where we are today. All of you today. So clearly and ultimately, the time is now for us. Santan Santan It is my great honor and privilege as a Providence native to introduce the Santander brand to the U.S. best about Santander is our commitment to planting deep roots in the communities in which we serve. Santander is setting a new level for corporate giving in the city to our public parks, which is phenomenal.
So it's hard, it's hard for me to summarize in one word what that felt like, but it was amazing. It was amazing and an effort by hundreds of people to get us to that day. We also, on that day, embarked on a multimedia um, campaign across our entire footprint. Uh, t TV, print, out of home, radio, digital, social. Of course, our, our branches were all part of the advertising that was happening. And we really viewed it as what we called the one-two punch. We thought it was really important to first come out into the market and first just introduce ourselves to say hello and who we were and who was sent in there and how we felt about our consumers and what we had learned from them and what was a bank for your ideas really all about. Two weeks later, we, we then added on to that the Blockbuster product, Extra 20 Checking, which was really all about delivering on this idea of listening and simplifying and enabling. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So let me share with you the advertising that we did around the brand when we first launched. Sweet old ashes lie, celebrate your dreams when you are away. Doesn't it taste so sweet? Like it's growing on all, growing on the trees. Not every idea needs a bank. We're here for the ones that do. Introducing Santander, a bank for your ideas. The objective was to introduce ourselves, not to talk a lot about ourselves, to really get hopefully consumers to be interested, to learn more about us, and take the next step with us. So we followed this, as I mentioned, with the Blockbuster product, Extra 20 checking that we have now out into the marketplace. And we felt if we had a Blockbuster product, we needed to have a Blockbuster celebrity associated with the product. So there was a lot of work behind the scenes to select um, the right celebrity to be associated with our brand. Many hours, and, and very early on, we decided that we wanted Robert De Niro. And very early on, we thought we couldn't get Robert De Niro. But we were going to get Robert De Niro. So you know why? Why, why Robert De Niro, or Bob, as he likes to be called? Um, well, first of all, he's a household name. We wanted, you know, we're Santander. We're not that well known in this market. We wanted a household name. We wanted someone that was American. We wanted somebody that was really likable. And he has 100% likability scores, men, women, young, old. And he had a flawless background. And we crossed our fingers, and nothing would happen once we signed him on with us. <laughs> Thankfully, he's lived up to that. So you know, we wanted um, De Niro, and it took a lot of persuasion and a lot of late nights, but we were able to finally um, secure him to be associated with uh, this product. So let me show you a little bit about the campaign um, that's now running. Hopefully, you're seeing it. At Santander Bank, we wanted to reward our customers with something unusual like sending you to a Robert De Niro movie with Robert De Niro. Have you seen this one? No, but I'm excited to. Spoiler alert, everybody dies. My performance is wooden. I'm like a canoe. Too big, too dull, too small. Luckily, our customers had a better idea. Just have direct deposits totaling $1,500 and pay two bills with online bill pay every month, and we'll give you $20 every month. Extra 20 checking. Open your account at SantanderBank.com or visit your local branch. the campaign was across all different media challenges. We were you know, out of home on the subway. We were doing billboards. We were on the radio and obviously on the TV. So the final piece about our creative was this whole notion of how do you say Santander. And we knew early on that people were having a hard time with the pronunciation. So we decided we were going to have some fun with it. 
And first and foremost, we need to make sure that our own team members could say the company's name right. So we decided to first launch with the contest internally. And so let's just take a, a quick peek. This is really funny um, about how you say Santander internally. Santander. It should be pronounced Santander. Santander. I know how to say it. Santander. In China, we say Santander. It's pronounced Santander. Our customers always get Santander confused with Santander. Salander? It is Santander. Santander. It is Santander. A contest! So it's a contest on how to say Santander? Santander. In Boston, we say Santander. These are for a company called Santander. They are a bank, and we're making signs for them. It's Santander. It's Santander. All you have to do is videotape yourself saying Santander and send it on in. What do we win? What's the incentive? You can include your family, friends, or team members, but it can only be 15 seconds long. Santander. 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 Here in Philly. We say Santander. I'm from Rhode Island, and we would say Santander. 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 Make sure you say it with Santander spirit. Santander. I say the new big name is Santander. Santander. So then we decided we also, from an external perspective, wanted to have a little bit of fun with it because we also knew in the marketplace um, that, you know, in every market that we, we operate in, there was a different way to say it. And, and to set the, state, the story straight, we, we don't care how everybody says it, but we thought we'd have some fun with it. So we did do a radio commercial, and why don't we just take a quick um, listen. You may have heard this when we first launched the brand. Hi, we're Santander Bank, and we look forward to getting to know you. The only thing is we've noticed people have trouble saying Santander. Santander? That's the most common one. And then there's how your grandma says it. Santander. And your postman. Santander? Your uncle. Santander. And your uncle's parrot. Ah, Santander. <laughs> now, you might know us as a bank for your ideas. And hey, that's who we are and what we're all about. Even if you say Santander like your personal trainer. Santander. Your chiropractor. Santander. Or your lawyer. I'll get back to you. It's okay to say Santander like your neighborhood librarian. Santander. Your daughter's boyfriend. Whatever. Your friend who just got back from Paris. It's pronounced Santander. Or the guy who runs that old-timey riverboat cruise. Santander. The bottom line is we're Santander. And we want to help you make your ideas a reality, however you say our name. Santander. That's it. Santander. A bank for your ideas. Santander Bank, NA member FDIC. This was so funny. When this was running, I was walking to work one day, and I was following behind this group of women, and they were, like, each taking a role in this commercial. It was so funny. They were, one was being the chiropractor. One was, so we felt it had some impact, and we got some uh, traction with this radio commercial. So... Obviously, all this is for results at the end of the day. And um, so this is just a sneak peek of after three months, and even at, at this point in time, this gets consistent, that we're seeing great results from all the effort and all the work that we've put into it and all the time with our consumers to really understand what's important to them. From an awareness perspective, our brand awareness has, has, has risen, continues to, to rise every single month when we look at it. Our consideration is up. Our brand momentum is up. We're seeing our sales up. Our Extra 20 product has won Quite a few awards. We just recently won a new product award by Nerd Wallet. And most importantly, our team member engagement is up. That as being part of this process and being engaged in this rebrand has really enabled them to feel more part of who Santander is and what is their role in that. So I thought I would end by just, um, you know, maybe a couple lessons learned. Because uh, I've had some time to think about this now after this is behind us. And there's probably a lot of lessons to learn. But these are a couple highlights if you ever go through this experience on your own. Number one, I would say, 
make sure you get executive buy-in to something like this. This was a success because our CEO was incredibly involved in this. He was at every governance meeting. He was really involved in the process. He set the stage across the organization that it was important. Rebrand was a second job for everyone. It wasn't like, oh, we stopped our day job and we're gonna rebrand. Rebranding was happening on top of everything else. And because of his leadership and his vision and he was part of it, we were able to make it move forward and get the traction that we needed with everyone across the entire organization. Number two, I would say from, from our perspective, we needed to engage all of our stakeholders and we really needed to have strong governance and ongoing communication in a way that we were all working collectively towards a common day. If we didn't, everybody would have been off doing their own thing. There was a really finite period of time, a lot of people working on this project, a tight PMO around it, but ongoing communication and collaboration. That is what made it work. This was a sum of many people working together towards a common day to be able to see success. The next is be prepared for the unexpected. All I can tell you is this entire project had unexpected things happen throughout all of it. I can tell you when we got to New York to see Robert De Niro, he was still in his trailer and hadn't even signed the document with the contract. We didn't know if he was going to come out and do the commercial. Thankfully, he did come out and do the commercial. We didn't know if Michael Bloomberg was actually going to go on stage with, with our chairman. What if something happened in, in, in New York City? He wouldn't have arrived. He wouldn't have gone on the stage. And that probably wouldn't have been very good from our chairman's perspective. We didn't know if our website was actually going to launch on that day. There were so many things going on behind the scenes. We didn't know if all the communications on our technology platforms were going to happen. There was so much unexpected. Always be prepared. We were always thinking, what could go wrong, and what's our backup strategy? Listen, listen, listen. I can't say this enough. Like, this is a part of our culture. We continue to have a relationship um, with Communispace and other vendors where all we're doing is really listening and talking to consumers. This made the difference. This really did. This helped us get into a deeper level of understanding about what was important and it's part of our DNA and obviously it's one of our pillars of who we are as an organization. And finally, surround yourself with a great team. I mean, this was really about the team and the team, the internal team, I mean, most of them are sitting in here today who made this possible. It was about all of our partners, Arnold, Communiscase, PGR, Hatch, and anybody else who's our partner, I'm sorry for not saying your name, but you're all part of it. You all made it happen. Honestly, everyone worked tirelessly towards this day. I've n I honestly have never seen anything like it. 226 days is not a lot of time for what we're talking about. It wasn't just, as, as you know, a name change. Having the right team, having people committed, being part of it, working together is really what made it successful. So it wouldn't have happened without them. So that's our story. And um, I'm open for any questions, or none. <laughs> hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> hi, I just wondered if you could share the story about 1017 and why you picked that day. You said uh -huh. it was funny. Yes. All right, well, there was, a, there, was, there was a rational side and maybe not such a rational side. So the rational side was, we knew all these projects we had to do, and we had to really figure out how much time was it going to take to you know, build websites and launch ATMs and everything. So that was first and foremost in the back of our mind. But really, at the end of the day, our chairman said, I'm coming on October 17th, and that's the day you're going to rebrand. And we said, we love that day. <laughs> really, that was what kind of happened. I don't know if that's a great answer, but that is the answer. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, question. Um, obviously, you put a tremendous effort into a great launch. How do you maintain awareness after that? And what can you share in terms of your plans moving ahead? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're working. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, that was sort of a real build up. And the, the key is to continue, continue on our strategy. You may have noticed on the chart that to us, it wasn't just a point in time, let's do advertising. We, really early on, we said this is an 18 month, two year, just even the rebranding itself and to continue educating people who we are and who is sent in there, that still is happening today. So we're continuing to meet on plans and marketing and advertising to be able to do that. We have to keep being out there in unique and interesting ways. So it's an ongoing, even the day we launched it, we said, this is an 18 month plan and it's even beyond an 18 month plan. You have to continue with the momentum. And I think because we have, we continue to see our awareness keep going up and up and up every day. But our competitors are much higher than us, so we have to keep going. Hi, hi, I'm not, yes, okay. Whoever has the mic, I guess I'm, I'm answering first. Um, sure, so uh, ever since I've seen the new logo, um, what fascinated me was 
Uh, here is a rare new brand coming out with a serif typeface. Um, everybody's <laughs> wow. dropping their serifs all over the place. So I'm, be able to answer I'm interested in like tell. what the typeface is, if anybody happens to know. Um, also, and uh, it's you know, there's a, we have red banks, we have green banks, we have blue banks. I think I don't know if we have blue banks anymore, but I think we were blue at one point. So I mean, I'm also interested in what you know, in terms of those core elements, was was there any strategic thinking behind that? So I'd like to take credit for that, but these are our global standards. I don't know if we know what font it is. But I can, I can take your card and tell you what font it is. But, you know, those are part of our global standards. So that logo, that flame, that lockup, the, the red that we have is part of who we are. And every, everywhere you see, in every country that you go, there is consistency. I can say there's some things you don't mess with, and that was one of them. You see me in red. We don't mess with our red. And I was trying to find it, but I had a, uh, a Pantone chip with me, and then I had a Rawl chip with me. I carried it around for a year. To do our branches, we change those ATM colors, because red on every single type of element looks very different. And I'm not joking. We kept changing and changing and changing until we got to the perfect red that was the standard, the global standard we use everywhere so we could have consistency. But I'm happy to tell, find out what the what the logo, what the actual font is. It's serif. It's serif, right? Heave it. We had the Arnold experts. There we go. We have the real expert back there. All right. So you can go, Christian knows. They know all the fonts. But it is a great, it is, I mean, the red is unique. There's a lot of reds, but I, we think it's really unique and it really pops. So we're very proud of it. I never wore red until I went to Santander. <laughs> hey, two questions. Thanks, first of all. That was really great. Thank and you. Uh, two questions for you. First is, how are you understanding the effect of um, advertising? Right, there's yep. a lot of people in yep. various forms of uh, ad buying and selling yep. here. How are you measuring that? And second, I was actually surprised to see your um, your Twitter accounts are like uh, closed off. Like, you have to follow to you know tweet at you. I was kind of curious yeah. about that as well. So, in terms of advertising, we are continuing to test our advertising. I mean, we look at it from a the absolute perspective with brand awareness and consideration, but we're also looking a lot on our website, on search. I mean, I can tell you when we, when we launch our advertising, here's a statistic. Before we launched, we had 1,800, eight peop, 1800 a week people coming on search looking for Santander. After we launched our advertising, it was up to 300, over 300,000 people searching on Santander. So we can, every time our advertising is on, we see our search go up, we see our website traffic go up. We, see our, we, we track our brand awareness on like a bi-weekly basis, I think, so we are paying to do it much more frequently right now to see what's working. So we're constantly tracking. It's hard to look at offline, but the offline to the online is where we're starting to really see a lot of results. Um, from a Twitter perspective, we're really early on in our social. I would lie if I said we're, we've, we've perfected the, the social strategy. We're just now getting going on social. I mean, and even Twitter is very, we have very few people on Twitter with us. We've been focusing much more on Facebook. So there really isn't a strategy to keep people out. We're just trying to really build that up and be open and engage people. But we have a lot of work to do, I'll be honest, on our social platform. And we're working on that. Is it on? Yeah, it's a great presentation. I'm wondering if you can talk about some, in your career or, or throughout this process, some models that you were following or some, some key do's and don'ts from other companies or other brands as you're going through this rebrand? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, some of it will be much more on the, you know, I would say process side of it, to be perfectly honest. With a project this big, and I touched on it a little bit, a project this big, you really need to be organized and you really need to have, I, I think why it was successful was because we had a really strong governance and we really had a commitment that people had to have, I mean, these, our teams can talk about it, was relentless of, What's your plans? What are you doing? How are you moving forward? Constant tracking. So for a project this big, you absolutely need to have um, you know, standards around how you run it and how people are interacting because people have a lot of different perspectives of how they should do things. Um, and, from a, and from a brand perspective, we did. We did a lot of work looking at a lot of really great brands and how they did it and how they brought themselves into the market. You know, Arnold was instrumental in helping us do that and really evaluating the do's and don'ts of what we saw. But, one big thing I can say that was important to us is we didn't want to come into the market talking about ourselves. So I can say there was a bit of a debate, I guess you could say, between Global and ourselves that, you know, obviously the Santander Global brand is so impressive everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world, everybody knows Santander. And there's like a little bit of like, you know, bravado around that, right? In the U.S., it's not the same. 
we really felt strongly that we needed to come in and you know, be a little bit more humble and, and show that it really was about the consumer and it wasn't really about our 14,000 branches and you know, 102 million customers around the world. Those are important things that people will search out when they want to know about you, but we really wanted to come in really being about the consumer and what it means to us to work with our consumers. So that's maybe one nugget I could say. Does your uh, plan, uh, the second phase of your plan, include, <laughs> include targeting any of the uh, public broadcast demographic, which is uh, an interesting demographic for banks? Um, you know, it's interesting, right? I will say right now, from an, from an advertising and marketing perspective, we're doing a lot more of looking into deeper target markets. When we started, we, we definitely threw a wide cast, right? We, we had zero, I wasn't joking, we had zero brand awareness, and we knew when we first entered into market, we really had to put our, our, our a wide net out there. We're now doing a little bit, a lot more work behind the scenes, looking much more into different target markets, what's important to them, what's their, per, their, their purchase, you know, their, their journey to purchase, how do we need to interact with them, what's important to them. So there's a lot more going on right now behind the scenes that's much more targeted so that we can be refined. We still need the wide cast because our awareness needs to happen. But we also see some opportunities to refine that a little bit. Uh-oh. Hi. There's so much uh, being written these days about the use of celebrities mm. in advertising. And I understand why you picked De Niro. But could you talk a little bit about the conversation that you had, especially with Arnold? Barb, I don't know whether you want to comment also. Just uh -oh. on, you know, people always say, well, you know, a celebrity really makes a difference or the yeah. whole thing's a bunch of bull and, you know, it's just it, yeah. it's lazy to do that. So was there controversy around the decision to use a celebrity in your ad and what was the conversation like? Yes, <laughs> there was. There was. I, you know, there, there, it's a great question. There was controversy about whether or not we wanted to use a celebrity. I can and it went it really went both ways. Arnold felt one way, we felt another way, you'll guess which way. And, um, and our global company was also part of that. You know, they had a really strong opinion as well. They had seen great results by using celebrities, but there was, there was just a little different model because they had sports celebrities. You know, if you know anything about Santander, Formula One and soccer is really big to them. And those, they use that as the grounding to build their brand in every other country around the world. But those celebrities, those sports figures, didn't work in this market. So there was a lot of conversation back and forth about whether or not we should use somebody. And you know, why did we eventually do it? We felt that he would add a little bit more of that American piece to us. You know, there was a lot of debate back and forth, Santander, how do people feel about a global, and even in our communities, right? We saw how do people feel about global and local. We felt that could add a piece to it by having a celebrity with us. And we also thought it would really help with our awareness, that it would instantaneously, you know, get out in the market, people would look at us and stop. But there was a debate. I know Barbara's gonna talk about it. Oh, look, you're standing up. <laughs> this is my stage. You, yeah, sit right down, on. man. I have my Santander red All on. All right, you go right ahead. Um, yeah, since I did you need to asked, drink some water. Diane, and it, we did have a long and healthy debate, even down to the moment when the contract wasn't signed yet. <laughs> we did, actually. Um, you know, it's 50-50 if you read all the data, which I think everybody knows, there is as much of a reason to use a celebrity for all the reasons Kathy mentioned as there is not to because it's on borrowed equity. You don't know what the hell they're going to do in their personal time. Your brand can tank accordingly. Uh, it's a lot of money. Is it really worth the spend? If you're doing ROI, which we are, is it really worth it? And at the end of the day, um, I think our mission at Arnold was merely to be a different kind of bank. And so many banks use celebrities. So I think our argument was more about, can we go out and do something that isn't reliant on a celebrity so we don't look like every other bank out there? But when you know when we sat down and realized, I mean, that is a pretty serious zero that you saw up there on the screen, we needed to hit the ground running very fast. And if we were going to get you know a C or a B list celebrity, we said, we would. I, I think we all would have gone down on our sword if it was a C or a B list celebrity. But given that we were looking at some of the, I mean, we were looking at Tina Fey, we were looking at Oprah, we were, I mean, we, we weren't looking at, you know, not, I'm sorry. yeah, you know, people who we were. We had big aspirations <laughs> at one point. Then they came down a little bit. <laughs> I, I'm, twitching a, I'm twitching a little at some of these memories coming back, but that's okay. So when Robert De Niro actually became interested, it was a very different process. You can tell that's not Robert De Niro hawking extra 20. 
That is Robert De Niro working with our creative teams. And we script, we sent Robert De Niro 10 scripts. Robert De Niro worked with our teams to write a script that he would be willing to be in as a celebrity. So it was different, and different was what we wanted to do. It was about using Robert De Niro's equity, yeah. his unbelievable acting and, and, and humor, and allowing us to sort of get our message in in a way that was doable for us and doable for him. So in the end, it accomplished our goal in a, in a way that I don't think, if we hadn't done it that way, we would have still been unhappy about it. But this was a great way to do it. I would just caution everybody, you gotta really go through, oh my God, I mean, you have to go through painstaking ways to make sure these guys are not gonna screw your brand. They really do. It really was a hard decision. Yeah, he didn't. He was Bob, her best Where's friend, Bob. Bob. No, but it was a hard decision. One more, Kathy. Okay. One more? Maybe not. Anybody else? Well, that was good, Kathy. You, you shut them down. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for coming and hearing our story.